every time I get up in front, I feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> That's what we thought. <laughs> For those of you that are uh, not here watching, uh, there's an announcement in the bulletin uh, for your benefit. The church is seeking to sell the current parsonage in order to purchase a different one. A church conference will be held on Sunday the 25th for a membership vote. Voting time will be from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. on that day. You can vote in person by phone to the church office at 689-5911. Or by email to whitecloudumc at ATT.net. Any questions, feel free to call me on my cell phone. My phone number is 231 224 3470. There will be a meeting chaired by Pastor Jerry after the service on the 25th. Thank you. Are there any others? Okay, let's go to celebrations. I'm going to start out. I have two of them. Uh, my son turns 44 on Wednesday, and my mother, where she's still alive, uh, on April 21st, she would be 90. I can't believe she would be 90 years old. Your son's almost as old as you are. Almost. <laughs> almost. Are there any other celebrations? Miss Barton. I know you can't tell by my suntan, but I just got back from 10 days in Mexico with my lovely husband, my four children, and my five grandchildren. It was a fantastic vacation. Um, it was a combination of granddaughter Elizabeth's spring trip for her senior year in high school and a belated 50th wedding anniversary. So I just want you all to know, even though you can't see my suntan, my goal was not to be burned, and I did that. This woman has put up with me for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Our first baby turned 30 last week. Taurus? Uh, grandson, young Jeff, sir, has a birthday yesterday. He's somewhere in the late 20s. <laughs> 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 can't remember where. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, let's sing to honor all of those celebrations.
the Lord. We have the offering plates in the back. Um, just place your offering there on your way out. And any offering is greatly appreciated. And also any of your celebrations, you can leave them there. Uh, let us pray the prayer of thanksgiving. <clears throat> Jesus, you have blessed us with so very much. And we thank you for each and every blessing and every gift. We pray that you bless the giver, enrich their lives with your love. We pray, Father, that you help us to use these gifts to your glory and use them in our church, our community, our nation, and our world. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Prayer course, Emmanuel. <laughs> For Andy, he's going in for back surgery this coming Thursday. Andy, I never knew. <laughs> well, you hope to stand up straight and tall, huh? All right. Enjoy. I want to thank people for praying for Caitlin, and I know she's doing better. Yeah, we think our granddaughter's doing better, but the mystery is never knew what was wrong. So. <laughs> A lot of things you like working on an old Ford 390. When you're done, you don't know if it's going to work. Just do your best. We have twins in our family, born on the night, and uh, Casey, uh, my cousin Casey. Um, she had twins, two little girls. They're doing great. All of them are doing great. Their names are Eva and Ivy. Oh, cool. Congratulations to Casey. <laughs> twins are wonderful. But one don't think of the other one does. <laughs> I do have to tell a story. Casey shared that 
I stayed and she was doing all right. So plan on that. Huh? All right. Jerry, I have one. <coughs> My son John has been having some issues with his shoulder and his neck. Uh, he had an MRI, and I can't remember the term it is, but basically his spinal column is being compressed a little bit. Uh, just fourth and fifth vertebrae or something like that. So he has to go on Thursday to have a procedure done where they the steroids, oral steroids haven't worked. So he, they're going to use, as an x-ray as guide, put a needle right in that spot with steroids and whatever else and hopefully reduce the swelling. If that doesn't work, then he's going to have to have surgery. So. She sounds like about her son having some compression here in his spine and he's a truck driver over the road so I think it might be time to change careers because almost nothing down seven hours a day kind of does something that's fun. That's for sure. Well let's pray then. God you've heard all of these requests and you know the concern of every family here and you know the church has dreams these people this congregation has dreams of flourishing and growing and blossoming like a rose in the spring and we're going to have a church conference to kind of talk about how we can go about doing that and meet some needs and conditions but we also have these other needs of our soul and our spirit and wherever we feel broken and hurt and where we need mending our families, in our lives. We are grateful that we can share all these things with you, that you know all our secrets anyway, but as we share them with you and one another, we tend to get into a healing process that brings new life to us, that we get unstuck, so that we don't have the same old, same old, but we have new possibilities, blossoming every day. So turn us loose from the bear trap that's caught us by the angel, by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we can flourish and move and grow and beyond anything we ever dreamed possible. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
In case she hasn't noticed too, I want to tell you that this is going to happen sometime. I have a tendency to tell people to go wash their hands, and then I don't believe them. So then I say, prove it. It usually ends up with me smelling a dirty little hand <laughs> to Let's make sure that there's soap. Those are how you just sniff a clean hand. <laughs> that means that you were telling the truth. But sometimes I just don't believe them. I don't think that they actually wash their hands or something like that. It is paper towel in there. We'll talk about that in a minute. So sometimes things like that are going to happen where somebody just does not believe what you tell them. So today, that kind of talks about that a little bit in the Bible. So last week, we talked about Easter and after Christmas. Um, after Jesus was risen, he was walking down the street with some men, and then he ended up with the disciples. And one of the disciples wasn't there. His name was Thomas, and he wasn't there to see Jesus at that point. So then, imagine Jacob running to tell you, oh my gosh, I saw Jesus, I saw him, I saw him, I saw him. And you say, mm, I didn't see him, I don't believe it. I didn't get to smell his clean hands, so I don't know that he actually was there. So, they called him Doubting Thomas, because they didn't believe him. And sometimes I'm a doubting mom, and I don't believe that you washed your hands. Or if you did wash them, that you didn't use soap. So, <laughs> it happens sometimes. People doubt people. It happens. There's just no way to get around it. And as you grow up, you're going to run into things, obstacles in your life. And you're going to wonder, and you may even doubt whether or not God loves you at that moment in time, and things like that. You'll have times where maybe a friend is mean to you, or someone might get sick, or you just might have an all-around bad day, and then you're going to wonder about things. Or somebody gets stuck upside down because they won't listen to their mom. And so, um, absolutely not. Um, so sometimes things are just going to happen, and you might doubt. Well, here's what happened. After Thomas doubted that Jesus had come back, he ran into Jesus, and Jesus said, I want you to look at my hand. He didn't ask him to smell it. He did ask him, though, <laughs> to touch the wound that was in his hand, to touch it and to feel it, and to know that he was Jesus. So I'm going to ask you something. Do you think, hold on one second. Fletcher, do you know what float means? Float is when something just kind of hovers on the water. Let's try it with this cat. So do you see how that floats around in there? Do you think this paper clip will float? Can you put this in the water and see if it floats? Do you think it'll sink? Oh, what did it do? Sink. It sank right to the bottom, didn't it, buddy? So what I'm going to ask you is, if you don't see it with your own eyes, do you believe it? We are going to, I'm going to show you how to make a paper clip float, okay? We'll say that this red one is you, Fletcher, okay? We're going to see if we can make it float. Okay. That's the smallest one. Just give it a minute. We'll see if they float. And so, when things happen in life, oh, float, can you figure out what? You're floating, Fletcher, do you see it? You're floating above on top of the water. How? How did that happen? We put one in and it sank to the bottom. And look at you, you're floating around there, just lazing it up in the river. Well, that was floating. Yeah, but that one's still stuck. Well, like, if that one's one of you two, you're floating, and the other one's going to be floating here in a second. That one thing you would move. No, just give us a key. Even though I sank like a rock down there to the bottom. It's the biggest one. Well, that's not really why. <laughs> I guess I should have done that differently. Why is one of them not moving? Because the water's just being stagnant, that's all. So, I just want you to remember that sometimes in life, you've got to be like this paper clip, and you just have to have a little bit of faith. Why are you adding more water? I, I'm out of water, so there's no adding more water. Um, and then you probably sink. <laughs> So sometimes, and yep, he just made himself sing, just like I said. Sometimes in life, things are going to happen, and you may begin to doubt things, but no matter what, Jesus is always there for us. Even if you can't see him, you just have to believe. So I'm going to give you a paper clip so that you can remember. Unless I guess if you'd like your red one, it's a little bit wet. Look. Don't you want 
primer paso es ignorar, ¿no? Sí, yo. En ese que ya entiendes. So sometimes you just have to have a little bit of faith. Okay, can we pray, guys? Can we get water everywhere? We get water again. Dear God, we thank you that as long as we believe in your Son Jesus, who came here to save us. That you will always be with us no matter what happens. You will be by our side. You will help us whether we sink or we float. Thank you. Amen. He can always be trusted to forgive us and take our sins away. 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and his message isn't in our hearts. My children, I am writing this so that you won't sin. But if you do sin, Jesus Christ always does the right thing, and he will speak to the Father for us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I threw a little curve to you because I asked you to read the text out of the uh, contemporary English Bible, which reads a little different than what you have before you. But maybe you enjoyed it. It's easy to understand. We can do it again. Well, this sermon is about how secrets affect our lives and how telling the secrets and sharing that secret with somebody can begin a healing process. Um, one of the things I ask the computer is uh, how much energy does it take to keep a secret? And it didn't have an answer. Um, I asked, uh, I read somewhere that it takes 33% of your energy to digest food. And so I want to check that out again. So I asked the computer that this morning. And it says, uh, for protein, it takes 30% of your energy to digest food. So if you're sick and want to get well, one of the things you could do is go hungry, and then all your energy goes to, towards your healing. But I wonder if you've thought about how much energy it takes to keep a family secret, mm -hmm. to keep anybody from knowing about it. This is our family. And what would it be like if you didn't have to use all that energy up to keep a secret? And how these disciples had the secret about Jesus. And the secret is, he's alive. But if we tell anybody, they'll say you're crazy. Mm -hmm. We can't tell anybody about this. And so, they had this bursting inside. He's alive. And if you read the first chapter of Acts, it tells you how Jesus kept appearing to them over 40 day period. And so this energy is building inside of them that Jesus Christ is alive. Well then, one of the things that's interested me all my life is the fact that Jesus Christ seemed to do all these wonderful things and I'm saying, where are you, Jesus? You know, we could, we've got people with uh, all kinds of diseases and problems and need healing seems like we're not getting very far with it. And so I got involved in psychology, religion, and healing for my own knowledge to try to figure out what kind of roadblocks are we humans putting in the way of these spontaneous remissions of cancer and, and other diseases. And uh, so I'm going to share a little bit of that with you and then we're going to come to the place where we have this wonderful treasure from Jesus Christ. It almost goes around all this other stuff to where we can experience some wonderful things. We have a secret in Jesus that we're just discovering more and more about what that secret is. So we'll begin with um, a family systems theory, theory with uh, that, uh, Murray Bowen and Ed Friedman were big in that, and then I want to go to or Hellinger, who was a uh, priest to the Zulus in South Africa, and he got involved in uh, some more invisible stuff, the healing of the soul. And then we'll get into the wonderful gift that First John offers us, a healing that's really quite wonderful. So, first place in uh, Bowen's idea was that family secrets keeps family stuck, emotionally stuck, keeps them from growing and maturing. And Ed told us two stories. I was part of a clergy group that would go a couple times a year his bed. But, um, there were two families, and each family sent a child off to, maybe it was an Ivy League college, and um, each student met with tragedy at the college. And one of the families, talked openly with their student about what happened. They talked about the supper table. They 
talked openly about it. They didn't hide it. They didn't try to keep it a secret. And this child went on in life and functioned well in life. The other family felt so ashamed and thought it was such a ta terrible tragedy. They didn't talk to anybody about it, let alone the student, maybe once or twice, and they just tried to brush it under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. And their student didn't function very well in life because this thing I had, you know, when you have a secret to keep, it keeps you focused on that. And if your family says it's a terrible thing and a shameful thing, then you, you just have this wet blanket over your life. So Bert Hellinger comes along, and he comes more at this from the perspective of Christ, being that he was a Catholic priest and a missionary. And he tells about um, every family seems to have somebody that they're ashamed of, and they'd like to pretend they never existed. And um, Bert's claim, and this seems like an outlandish claim uh, to you, and maybe to me too sometimes, but Billy and Johnny had this child, and the child has a lot of physical illnesses and a lot of problems and goes to the doctor and they try all this stuff and nothing seems to work. So they get involved with Bert, how come my child can't get well? And he starts asking them about their family. Who, who in your family, your relational family system, uncle, aunt, brother, sister, is there anybody in your family that you have disowned, that the family has disowned? <coughs> yeah, well, oh, Uncle Bob or Aunt Mary, whoever. And he would then direct the family. Somebody would stand in and pretend to be this person. And then the person with the sick child would say to this person, we love you and accept you and invite you back into the family. So this is another way of talking about each family having a soul. That it's just beyond the individual person. We're part of an emotional field. You could look at that. We're all part of an emotional field. And we're always being influenced by this field. And that the real healing comes when we actually accept and love everybody in this emotional field. And so Bert claims there have been children healed of cancer. There's been all kinds of things that have happened miraculously. So that might answer a little bit of my puzzle about how come we're laying on hands and people aren't getting well. Then I ran into this book written in 1922, Psychology, Religion, and Healing. And this is an army chaplain. And uh, he gets into all kinds of stuff about the scripture, uh, demon possession, when Jesus healed, and the different ways Jesus healed. And he, he examines all this. And he told about people telling him their secrets. And uh, this one person, basically they're confessing their sins to him, what they're doing. And he's announcing forgiveness. And that's what Jesus said. Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive, they're not forgiven. Skin rash is healed. Phobia is gone away. So wonderful things happen in Jesus' name, but it's through this process of I'm confessing my guilt to someone and they're accepting me and loving me as I am. So now we have this secret uh, that is in the Jewish soul. And that secret is we have killed the Messiah. And when we were in Israel with Barb's mother, by the way, in the 1990s, our guide, our Jewish guide said, you Christians say Jesus is the Messiah, but we don't know. Well, what if in the Jewish soul there's this knowledge, this secret, this something eating at their soul, and I know I could get a lot of heat from this for the, from the religious community, that we did something wrong many years ago 
and it could still be affecting their lives, just like uh, in our country, we've done many things wrong historically, haven't we? And it affects us, how, how we treated our Native Americans and how we treated uh, people of different races. We, that does have an effect on all of us, so that there's room for everybody to confess something. And even people of these races, we affect to do stuff to each other, and so they have confession to make too to each other. I mean, we're all in this together. And all these things do affect us, but here is this bubbling up inside these people. I don't believe you guys are crazy. Well, we figured everybody would say that. I've got a touch of hand and seeing and feeling, and you read 1 John chapter 1, I'm telling you about what we have seen and what we have heard and what we have handled with our own hands. This Christ. And so Jesus said, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until my Father baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. So they stay and they hang out there. And they're in this upper room and they're praying together. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit comes on them and they start speaking different languages. Like suddenly Jerry's speaking Spanish, German, Swahili, blah, blah, blah. Both. And people are in shock. How can we... How are these northern Michigan potato farmers that never went to Michigan State or U of M or Oxford, how in the world are they talking to Gloria from Scandinavia? And this secret finally got out and God made sure that it got out. Well, then we have this problem of being human and being aware. I'm aware of all my sins, I think. And I think I paid for some of them. And if I hadn't, I'll keep it a secret. But here we have this offer from the gospel. If we say we have not sinned, we're not telling the truth. And I think if we say we have not sinned, we're still living in darkness. How can I get better if I can't admit something wrong? See, working with farm machinery, I could tell if my machine, machine was breaking down because the sound changed. Clatter bang had a different clatter. So I know something's going wrong. And when we're having a lot of trouble with our life, that's the way of God helping us know something is going wrong. Something needs to be repaired or fixed or changed. Um, I've always kind of hated death. I've uh, been a real protester of it. And um, I realize now that my love for antique cars has more to do with me hating death than loving those old cars. Because uh, we, we have this 1945 Lily's Jeep that we plow snow with in the winter. And when we're gone, Steph just has trouble. You, you have to pull the choke, turn the switch on, the electric fuel pump fills the carburetor, wait a couple of seconds, pump the throttle three times, hit the ignition switch. Rrr, 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 rrr. If it don't take off right away, stop. Pump the throttle three times again, and then go over to start. Rrr, rrr, rrr. And if it starts to rain, if it don't, you're probably done. You can have to put the battery and charge on it or something. That's if it's below zero or something. But the car we have now, the computer does it all. So unless you're an old timer, you don't know how to run this old stuff. Because you have to be the computer. And so I thought, well, we need to replace the Jeep for, for staff and when it was gone. But if 
I'm going to pray a lot. If we stop using him, he loses his purpose. He's dead. He sets in the back of him. Something happens. But Jesus taught me something different. People leave their bodies and they live on. Mm -hmm. You know, recently there was on Yahoo News this woman that says she's dead for 27 minutes. You know, usually your brain's gone to 10, can't be renewed. She scribbled on a piece of paper, it's real. She saw Jesus, she saw heaven's gate. And I appreciate that. But one of the things we need to remember is that Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. That means right now. So what 1 John opens up to us is that I can confess to Jesus daily and be forgiven continuously and be set free constantly from my past and live. Now, we're still 10 minutes away. I got another story to tell you. Because I like to watch Westerns. And um, this one is uh, about a range war. They used to have a lot of range wars. They were the free rangers, and then there were the people on that wreck electric or barbed wire fences and no free range. But you can imagine if you're a cattle man, free range, that's free food. You're not buying hay for cattle. That's a good profit. So they're having this war, and the rancher people came, and they shot this 16-year-old that was with the cooking wagon, and they were out fighting each other. And ends up, they take this kid into town, and the doctor, the doctor is out taking care of the people that shot the kid. And, his sister in the house ends up taking care of the kid the rancher shot. Well, the free range guy is very thankful when he finds out that she's not married to the doctor. But it's his sister. And she's pretty good looking. And their eyes kind of meet, you know, how people can talk without saying words. And they're both interested in each other. But he's afraid to tell her who he really is because of what he's done. Finally, the time comes when there's this last day and there's going to be a showdown in town between the two sides. And uh, he says to her, you know, I was in the Civil War. I killed a lot of people. And I've killed a lot of people since. <coughs> that kill people today. She says to him, I know there's a lot of good in you, and I'm going to give you my mother's locket and come back to me. Is that Jesus? This, this ability to see, I see the good in you. And it seems like with God this is ongoing. I see through this other stuff. And Jesus said that God looks on the heart. He did come back to her. He survived and they did hook up in the story and it's happily ever after. But it's this kind of redemptive possibility. So what I think is the miracle of the gospel, the real miracle, has to do with the emotional healing that can take place inside of us. When we understand that God loves us through it. Because being human, you're never, I don't think ever in this life going to be Mr. and Mrs. Perfect, sinless, whatever. I just... I tried, I don't, I 
just don't think it's in the realm of possibility, at least for me. I do my best, but what can I say? How are you guys doing with it? I mean, it's, you know, to be as perfect as Jesus, that's quite a tall thing to feel. But what Jesus tells us is it's safe to talk to God. It's safe to be who you are with God, and, and I know it does help to talk to one other human being, God with skin on about your issues, but you can't tell everything, right? Something maybe we should just not say. Do you think so, Bob? Just, boop. <laughs> Let's let that one lie. And some people gossip. But we can tell Jesus everything. Our emotional struggles, our problems, our fears, our hopes, our dreams. And it seems like this ongoing conversation with God is what builds the intimacy and the possibility of healing. You know, a lot of us carry guilt about a lot of different things. I should have done this, I should have done that. You know, I, my family asked me to do my dad's funeral. And my folks had been uh, away from church for quite a while because of their physical ailments and illnesses. And I said to myself, I didn't do my dad justice. It was, you know, I never felt like I did, did him justice. He was, in some ways, a miracle working person. We resurrected more old junk than you can imagine with an art broker in front of So I told him, you know, he'd been gone a while, I told him, you know, Dad, I'm sorry I didn't do the justice. I'm 100% sure he heard me. I really do. I, I think you can talk to people. Mm -hmm. that, that's how we heal our family soul. They're, they're not in the body, but they're with us. They're alive. And we can talk to them. So I think Jesus is still working miracles. Maybe it's not real showy, but to have a secret off your back, just think if those disciples would have kept Jesus is alive a secret. Where would we be? So, Christ the Lord is risen today and every day and is resurrecting me today and every day. And he's my best friend ever. Amen. So we'll sing that song.
maybe you've got an Aunt Mary or Uncle John or a brother or sister that's going on. Jesus invites us to love. And that doesn't have limits as far as people being in or out of their bodies. It goes forever and eternity. I'm inviting you to invite all your family into your life. Tell them you love and care about them. God loves and cares for us in that same way. And see, your life doesn't continue to get better and better. Amen. Amen.